Hi, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Off the Podium. I have Chris Kwapis with me. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it has. Uh, Time flies. Yeah, you know, I um, I usually have guests that I don't, um, I've never met before, but it's always great to see someone who I've, you know, met and worked with and uh, studied with and learned from, even though it was a short period of time. Yeah, it was short, but memorable, hopefully. Yeah, it was. That's how it I was, feel about it. It was fun. It was awesome. And I learned so much about things that I really didn't know about. Uh, so uh, we'll get to all of that on, on this Good. on this episode. What's, go- what's going on? What are you doing nowadays with the pandemic and everything happening around the world? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's so interesting because uh, time has become this, I don't know, very different construct than it has in the past. And I feel like... Um, my my usual life pre-pandemic, uh, there was a lot of travel and I didn't really get to spend much time at home. So I would always have a list of things that I would want to do when I did have a few days at home. And um, now every single day is a record of how many days in a row I've been at home. Yeah. And and I'm kind of embracing it. At first, it was there was definitely a mourning period of, um, you know, looking at the calendar and seeing all of the places and things and music that I was supposed to be playing and doing um, and people I was supposed to see and all of that good stuff. Um, but after that morning period, I feel like I'm, I'm really hitting a stride of doing more research and, um, you know, I've been preparing classes for the San Francisco early music festival, which is uh, doing a, a online summer festival, of course. And, And I've been immersed in that kind of research and writing some program notes and sort of doing a little bit of things that people have asked me to do, luckily, uh, to to keep me from being bored, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, um, something I didn't know, or maybe I did and I I forgot, Mm. uh, is that you have a doctorate in music. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe, maybe the journey to a doctorate, but I, I'm more interested to know uh, how you went from, you know, trumpet because I'm, you probably didn't, you probably didn't just play early music growing up from trumpet no. to actually being passionate about early music and Baroque trumpet and everything. Well, it, it's funny you ask because it, that's actually, uh, it started during my doctorate. Uh-huh. So I, I went to do a doctorate with the idea of being a, a typical orchestral player. However, I had always been interested in chamber music more than anything. And, um, and when I, when I went to start my doctorate at Stony Brook on Long Island, um, I went to study with a really great uh, classical, especially chamber music trumpet player, Chris Gecker. And it turned out that he ended up taking a job at the University of Maryland like the month before I got to Stony Brook. Wow. And so uh, at first I was a bit disappointed because I had always wanted to study with him. But it, you know, it's, it's funny the way life is sometimes. Uh, before that, in my master's degree, I took a performance practice class. Uh-huh. At, and this was at the University of Michigan with the genius Ed Parmentier, keyboardist and um, early music specialist. And, and I loved that class. I loved the, the idea of exploring this repertoire from a, um, from a performance point of view, but also the academic aspect of researching. And, and I loved that class, but at the time... I was pretty ignorant about Baroque trumpet and I had only heard a few recordings and my modern trumpet ears weren't prepared for what that would sound like. And <laughs> I, I didn't know what to embrace. I didn't know what was great and what was not so great. And uh, so I, at the time I thought, well, why would anyone want to play one of those things? But of course um, that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, I, I end up at Stony Brook and uh, they, it, it turned out, even though I wanted to study chamber music, there weren't enough people. It was a really small department and there weren't enough people to do a brass quintet even. And none of the string players wanted to have a trumpet player in their group, which yeah, I understand. <laughs> so, so that led me to the path of early music and, and that's where that's where I went. Um, 
And I went to hear a concert in New York City of, uh, it was Les Arts Florissant and they were doing uh, Purcell. And it was the first time I heard Baroque Trumpet live. And I knew right then, like, this is what I want to do. I need to figure out how to do this. Yeah. Uh, tell me about natural trumpet and Baroque trumpet. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. And... Yeah, no, that's a good question, too. Um, so we usually refer to modern trumpet as a trumpet with valves. Mm -hmm. So the one that we normally see, you know, in a typical modern orchestra. Um, and then the idea of a natural trumpet, uh, you know, back then they would have just called it trumpet, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, we call it natural trumpet today because it can only play the notes of the natural harmonic series. And then uh, in the like 1970s, people started to experiment with um, instrument construction and they were taking copies of trumpets from that time and adding some finger holes to it. And that is the, the thing that, you know, that's the term that we usually use now, Baroque trumpet, as opposed to natural trumpet, to indicate that it has those um, finger holes. Yeah. And the Baroque trumpet is, was created, I guess I should say, in, in, in the 20th century, right? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. And I, there, are, there are legends uh -huh. that um, people have some photos of, of instruments that were actually from the Baroque period that had some kind of alteration, some sort of finger hole type thing. Yeah. I haven't seen those, but I, I've, I've been told they exist. So I don't know for sure. There is also an account where, um, and I can't, and I need to find the source on this too, but uh, someone said after hearing uh, some handle that they wished the trumpets would have something like a flute, like a tone hole or like some mm. kind of system to help with some of those notes that are a little um, more indicative of the, f the frailty of humanity mm. in that <laughs> on, on certain notes that they're a little bit more out of tune. Yeah. So. I don't um, know if that answered your question. No, that's great. I, I you okay. know, one thing when I, when I think about classical music and then very specific, you know, eras or early music or other things, I just I wish it was promoted or marketed better so more people are interested, especially with early music. Because um, mm -hmm. years ago when I went to early music concerts, one thing that surprised me that I never thought about, I thought early music just meant, you know, some recorders. It was nice, little pretty music. But the performances I went to, they were so dynamic. They were so exciting. Yeah. And I would even describe in some moments aggressive. Uh, mm -hmm. It really excited me and it really you know, surprised me in a lot of ways. So, mm -hmm. so I wish it was uh, somehow musicians or marketing teams or something promoted it better because I know if people go to those concerts, they'll be so excited and surprised of what they thought it would be as opposed to what it actually is. So yeah. I don't know it, any, yeah. anything that has worked well for the organizations that you've worked with that they've done that has worked well that you could think of and maybe share some of your ideas. No, that's interesting. Um, your listeners can't see that I was like nodding my head vigorously at, in agreement huh. to to what you said. And um, you know, you've you've always been so smart and like aware of of things like this um, ever since I've known you. So I'm I'm not surprised that you would have that observation. You know, I think I think part of it is the the early music movement uh when it when it began like say in the 19 you know 50s 1960s i think it was so important for the people who started um exploring this music to emphasize the the scholarship behind it and i completely agree with that i think the scholarship is like super important and for me it's equally as interesting the scholarship as the performance itself and for and sort of like Monteverdi talking about the marriage of text and music and I feel like I feel like with early music performance practice it's that perfect marriage of scholarship and performance but I think because I, I think that um it, it ends up having a, uh, a sense, or, or it has, had a sense that because it's academic somehow, that means it's going to be boring. 
And I mean, it can be, but be it, you know, just like anything else, um, if we, if we use that scholarship to advantage, to help us understand the music from that time so that we can perform it in a way that is even more engaging, then it's a wonderful thing. But you are so smart to ask, like, well, how do we, how do we get people to know that? And that I think is like the million dollar question. So if, if you know, if you know the answer, don't keep it to yourself. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, for your listeners and for me, uh, for your followers and people who know your mm -hmm. career, some things that you do that not many people know about um, that you're willing to share with us. Oh, you mean like musically or no, hobbies or anything? Non oh. Stuff. Yeah. oh, yeah. Well, one of my latest obsessions is uh, visual art. Uh -huh. And I've been, um, I took a class at uh, uh, Gage Art Institute in Seattle about five years ago. And I had always wanted to take a class in this medium called encaustic, which is um, a medium where you use melted beeswax. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's supremely nerdy, just like everything I do. Mm -hmm. um, you have to melt beeswax with a, a certain percentage of this tree resin to harden it. And it's this ancient um, Egyptian way of of painting and you melt the wax into pieces of wood and then you can you can make panels with paintings and and things like that um you can you can see that back in um like the egyptian um tombs would have uh portraits of of mummies painted with this wax mm. onto pieces of wood that were part of the, um, the mummy. Um, uh, I don't know what the word is for that, but you know what I'm saying. And, uh, and so those, those still survive. And that sense of history, of course, is like right up my alley. But so I, I spent a lot of time lately doing, doing that, um, when I'm not doing music stuff, um, gardening, mm. cooking. Um, yeah, I mean that, that pretty much, that that's plenty to yeah. do yeah how's <laughs> how's uh, gardening in seattle i was just i had someone else um I, I was talking to recently and they're gardening in seattle and it's all the uh all the ups and downs of gardening in seattle is it I, I don't garden so i don't know so you tell me about it well this year is particularly challenging i think um i like this weather i'm a huge fan of this like gray skies and cooler weather mm -hmm. That's it's partly why I moved from New York <laughs> to Seattle uh, because I I was drawn to this kind of weather, mm -hmm. but this year has been particularly challenging with not enough sun. I feel like I feel like we're probably not going to get tomatoes at all, and tomatoes need a lot of sun yeah, yeah, yeah. and so um, and heat right. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, like I have a lot of kale and I have a lot of, uh, I had tons of peas and the beans are starting to come in and, you know, all of the greens and strawberries, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just, I don't know, there's something satisfying, I think, especially during these, um, this global pandemic that we're all um, enduring. Um, there's something really satisfying about being able to go out into your garden and pick some greens and have them mm. for a meal, like something that you took care of that, that happened, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and you answered it to a certain extent with um, uh, why you moved to Seattle, but uh, mm. you know, thinking of some great musicians, you know, Bill Frizzell, for example, he moved from New York to Seattle. And for those who don't know your career and, and don't know early music, you're one of the leading musicians in early music and you moved from New York to Seattle. Why New York to Seattle? Because you just like Seattle and you could, you're, you're traveling so much that you could just travel from Seattle anyway. So uh, why, what's the reason? Yeah, well, I, I think it was partly the weather. It was partly the, um, I don't know, at that time in my life, it was, boy, it was almost 13 years ago. I'm coming up on my Seattle-versary um, when I moved. Um, and I don't know, I just felt like, I felt like I loved New York. I was there for a decade, and I loved the people that I met and the experiences I had. Um, 
but I, I, I felt like I was missing this nature call. I grew up in a tiny town in Michigan and I felt like Seattle was sort of a mix, you know, it, it was a little bit more urban than my tiny town of like 2000 people. And what was that? But it, the town? It's called Ortonville. Okay. I know. No, you haven't heard of it? I'm so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was like, you know, I, I grew up in on like dirt roads and dairy farms and, you know, going swimming in the lake. And I mean, it was lovely. Um, there was a lot of time to practice, that's for sure, because there wasn't really much else to do. Um, but I felt like, yeah, after living in New York for 10 years, I was like, you know, I think I want something like, I don't know, as far away from that as I can. And, and Seattle really fit that bill. It has, it has this sense of um, creativity that I was looking for and like risk taking. I feel like, I feel like New York, although it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And, and like I said, tons of friends, and I'm sure you know tons of friends um, who love that place and it thrives and it's, it's wonderful. But I think for me, I wanted a place where I could, um, I don't know, experiment more and like feel like I could take chances and, and um, really focus on expressing myself as a person. And I feel like my work in the Northwest, especially in Portland, um, really reflects that, that mentality. Yeah. And for those who don't know, you mentioned Portland. There's also Seattle for early music, big communities of early music fans and musicians. Uh, why those two cities? And are there other cities in America that have such big uh, early music scenes as Seattle and Portland? Yeah, well, uh, I think, um, I don't know. I feel like partly the Northwest is like that sort of thing that I was just talking about, that mm -hmm that sense of exploration, you know, that is, it's sort of like baked into the way Seattle feels from its history as a, you know, gold exploration, you know, the, the people who are still here that were part of that movement of, of wanting to, um, yeah, like wanting to explore and wanting to, wanting to see new places, I guess. Um, and I think I think that West the West Coast just generally has that sense, mm -hmm. and maybe that's because I'm from the mid Midwest. But um, yeah, I, you know, San Francisco has another big um, early music community. Yeah. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It's really huge. Uh, so the Bay Area and San Diego is really starting to become a a place of 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 uh, renown for early music with the the San Diego, uh, the Bacalegium San Diego, mm -hmm. San Diego Bacalegium. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, and that's another, another place where there's, there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, and of course, you know, New York and Boston and Philadelphia and, you know, it, I feel like it's, um, it's definitely growing yeah. since I've, since I started doing early music uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, well, you mentioned you've been in Seattle for a while now, so there must be some spots that you really enjoy uh, and, and places that you kind of could get away and just, you know, enjoy on your own, maybe to relax or places that you just want to go and meet more people. Um, for those who don't know Seattle, what are some of your favorite places that you love to go to? You know, that's so funny to ask that right now because, uh, you know, <laughs> usually, usually my life is so... Um, it's just so frantic with the travel and um, and usually when I do get a chance to stay home or when I am home, um, I, I tend to take advantage of staying home. And of course now <laughs> I'm staying home and, and not going out much either, but for different reasons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. um, but, but when I, when I do like to get out, um, I live in the north side, so um, I'm in Shoreline. So Richmond Beach Park is nearby, and Edmonds. Um, there's a lovely park there. Uh, dog park. I used to uh, take a friend's dog there as often as I could because there's just nothing like looking out over the water, watching a dog swim, and and just enjoying that that sense of being near the water. 
it's just, it's a wonderful thing. Golden Gardens is also another, like, I love going there and watching the, um, uh, what, are, what are they called? The air, I don't know, they're wind sailing, I think is what mm-hmm. it's called. I love watching those guys do that. It's, it's so acrobatic and, and spontaneous. And, you know, it's kind of like what I want music making to be. Yeah. Um, now we didn't get to the teaching part, but you've taught at many oh, colleges. Yeah. You teach in master classes all over the world. Uh, you currently are on faculty, and you've been on faculty for over maybe a decade now with Indiana. Yeah, yeah, um, ten years at Indiana. Yeah. So, so h- how's that process? How is it? You know, what do you do there? What's what's your job? And also, how's it feel to? Uh, you're already traveling, but to teach at a college and you're going from Seattle to Indiana, h- how's that working for you? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's amazing. I have to say, um, Indiana is just the energy there is kind of ridiculous. There, there are so many students. And it as a as a teacher, it kind of it helps connect me to the young people of the world, right? I feel I feel so energized just being around my students and and being around these big dreams and and um, you know these aspirations. It helps it helps an older person like myself feel, <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know it helps me remember like how how that what that feels like to to wonder what what your life will be mm-hmm. if that makes sense, you know. Um, and now in a typical, in a typical time, uh, non-pandemic time, I usually spend about six weeks a year in Bloomington. And I split that up into six different visits. So I'm there for about a week at a time. And my students get sort of a seminar style. Uh, so when I'm in town, my students will have a lesson every day that week, for example. And, you know, the traditional way is for a student to have a lesson every week with their teacher and check in. But I find, I find that this really works well. And the feedback that I've gotten from my students is this works really well because it's sort of like an immersion. Uh It's almost like learning a foreign language with this. And, and if you get reinforced these ideas every day for a week in a row, then you have time to let those sort of settle before the teacher comes back in the next month. You know, it's usually like, you know, I'm, I'm usually there, say, September, um, October, November, and then I try to space it about a month apart. And then I, I'm usually off doing Messiah and stuff during, um, during December, so I'm, I'm not usually there then. And then school starts up again, like end of January, and we usually do that, um, do a similar kind of thing, January, February, March, or February, March, April, something. Um, I have eight students there. I have a cap and a wait list. So that's kind of fun to, to know that there are that many people interested in doing what we're doing. Um, yeah. That, so that's, yeah, I, I, I'm like, I always come back from those trips, like completely exhausted, but completely exhilarated and, and excited. I think teaching to me is actually at least as exciting as performing. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And, and, and it shows that, you know, you said there's a lot of interest in, in, in early music and what you're doing, but also it's because of you, because you're such an amazing performer and a teacher. And what I enjoyed about you is that I never felt that, I mean, um, of course there's, there has to be respect uh, for the teacher, (laughs) but, but you've always been so welcoming and friendly in that environment that uh, it makes the student, at least from my perspective, makes, makes the student want to learn even more and be interested in what you're doing and showing, even if it's some foreign so that's what I've appreciated about what you do and how you've taught um, I, I want to uh, I want to go back and and uh, a question awesome. I've, I've, I've had uh, so uh, for uh, for many of my guests in over 120 episodes is that uh, a life-changing moment mm-hmm. uh, a professional life-changing moment maybe mm-hmm. something to do with your music and and um, a, a personal life-changing moment if you're willing to share mm-hmm. a personal personal thing that has happened that changed your life yeah, I mean, I guess I already, there was a spoiler there. It was, you know, when I went to hear that, when I went to hear that concert um, yeah. of, of Lizard Florissant. And, you know, even before that, when I went to hear, uh, there was a traveling uh, performance of Mark Morris's uh, dance ensemble 
doing Dido and Aeneas. Um, this was back when I was a student at Michigan. And I saw that and I really feel like it was like a switch was turned on and I was taking the performance practice class at that time. So, yeah. And I, you know, I guess it's interesting. I wonder if you've had, you know, with your other guests about, you know, musical, personal, and I don't know, like, I, I wonder if your other guests have also had, had a challenge uh, separating those two things because I think they're so interconnected, right? Yes, you're, you're right about that. And many of them did say that. Many of them did say that. It's very, uh, you know, the personal and professional kind of comes together. So thanks for sharing that. I, I do want to yeah. know something else, uh, early music and classical music. Uh, put that aside. What do you listen to outside of those, you know, periods and music? Uh, is there rock oh, or yeah. pop or anything that you listen to? Well, boy, you know, I listen, I listen to a good variety of things. Um, my partner is, uh, likes to do music for fun. Uh -huh. He, he, it's not his, um, vocation, but, but he, he loves music and he has really turned me on to listening to some older, uh, jazz, like 1920s jazz, especially Bix Beiderbecke, like, I love that stuff. And I find such a connection with the way I think about early music in such a spoken way. And, and I love listening to that. Um, I mean, Freddie Mercury, any, anything that he's doing, I, I use, I try to channel his spirit when I'm playing because I think like that's what performance is. You know, it's not that boring stuff that, you know, we were talking about earlier, that academic thing, but it's, but it's this, you know, way of expressing yourself and like bringing yourself out to other people so that they can like live vicariously through you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's the stuff I listen to. Yeah. The touring, you know, since you tour a lot mm -hmm. and I've heard mixed things about, you know, I had Ransom Wilson on who's this famous flute player. <gasps> Superstar, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and he talked about touring and how, you know, uh, some parts of it, he, he was very grateful for the all the opportunities he had, but he was like, you know, it was tough. It was tough to tour, and he was saying how he toured with Jean-Pierre Paul and Jean-Pierre Paul was uh, more, all about touring. He loved tour, touring, and he really enjoyed that. But different people have different feelings. You sometimes have to do it because it's your job, but you don't really enjoy it. W what are some parts that you enjoy, uh, or yeah. maybe you enjoy everything, and what are some parts that you don't enjoy about touring and going all over? Yeah, well, you know, you know, the rock stars say I, I should find out um, the source for this one too. But but the quote is, um, you you don't get paid to play; you get paid to travel, right? <laughs> <laughs> like the playing, the playing you do for free. It's the traveling that you want to get paid for, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's. It's, it's a tough, you know, it's, it's interesting that you asked this question right now, of course, because had you asked me this question a year ago, I think I would have a, a little bit different answer because um, when you're in the thick of it, like in my busy years, um, sometimes I'm away from home like 175, 200 days a year. I mean, that's a lot when there are only 365 days in the year. Um, and I know there are, you know, lots of people who tour way more than I do, but, um, but, you know, there are certain things that are tough about it because when you're on the road a lot, you don't feel as connected, you know, say to your partner, um, or your cats, for example, um, or your yard or, you know, like things that you'd like to do at home or a sense of, um, I don't know, permanence or something like that. But it's those very same things. Like, I don't know, you, you appreciate that time when you're home more. You, you want to take advantage of that time when you do get to see your partner, for example. And, um, you know, things like that. Um, you know, the, the flights can, can be a bit of a drag. Yeah. But, you know, it's also an opportunity to to allow yourself to watch some movies or videos that you've downloaded so that, so that you can do it guilt-free without feeling like you're supposed to be doing work. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But you know, the, in, in terms of the best parts, um, I think, I think a lot of musicians can relate to this 
since we don't spend as much time as home at home usually our friends are on the road and so every time you're doing a gig you you usually if they're not if it's not all new people that you've never met before where you get a chance to make new friends you get to see friends that you've been working with for 20 years and you get to catch up with them in person and go out for a bit of a, a beverage afterwards after rehearsal or you know, I th- and I think that's the thing that I miss the most, um, aside from, you know, obviously making music with people and sharing stuff with audience members. It's that bond that you have with your friends yeah. in various cities. Yeah. 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 Well, something I think about when it comes to specifically early music, but there are other genres, even classical music in general has has this where, you know, uh, even though there are new composers in like the classical music um, uh f- genre if you want to call it um Mm -hmm. they're they're not often performed in early music how does that work are there uh are there new composers Uh, i mean that compose that style or how does that work because that's something i'm not uh, you know i'm not familiar with so i would love to get your thoughts on that yeah for sure well you know um One of the things that I was supposed to do this summer is a festival that I've played at for the last few years, I guess five years or something, in Stanton, Virginia. It's this tiny town in in the mountains um, in Virginia. But during August, there is a festival there that is, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like 10 days, 30 concerts. and it's of various uh, various repertoire. Um, p- there are people playing modern instruments, people playing period instruments. We do classical era on classical instruments and Baroque stuff on Baroque instruments. And then some people also play their modern instruments or other modern folks are come in and just do the modern stuff. And it's this, it's this incredible thing. And um, one of the pieces that I was supposed to do this year was, I believe, I, I know it's a U.S. premiere, but it could even have been a world premiere, but we'll do it next year. But it, it's based on uh, the ideas or the instrumentation of the Brandenburg Concerti. And so it's this composer, Stefan Hoike from um, Austria, Austria or Germany? Uh-oh. Um, maybe Germany. I think Germany. Anyway, um, we're supposed to do this piece and he sent, he sent the piece back in the fall so that we're kind of collaborating a little bit. He's at least getting some, some comments from me because it is interesting. I think, especially for an instrument like the trumpet, you know, other early instruments are chromatic. They can, it may not be, um, especially idiomatic, but they can really play anything that you could play in, on a modern instrument, you could play on an old instrument. But with trumpet, since we're not fully chromatic until the vowels, it's, uh, it's really, I think it's a real challenge for composers, especially if you want to write something that isn't super idiomatic, like exactly a style of the Baroque, but using period instruments because there's something about those natural harmonics that really are so idiomatic for Baroque music. And there's a reason. And so sometimes composers in the past that I've worked with will like take a chart of all of the notes that a trumpet can play and put them in whatever order, but it just, it doesn't work. It's, it's like, it's the instrument is just the instrument likes to tell you what is possible as a human, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and and that's also a challenge because, uh, you know, uh, every composer I talk to, at least on this podcast, uh, has always enjoyed some sort of a challenge where, you know, they're, they're put in these situations where like compose for this, they're like, wow, I never even thought of that, but let me, let me figure it out. So it's kind of a nice challenge for them. Oh Um, yeah, totally. yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back and and being a superstar like you are, uh, do you ah. practice? Do you do you how, how do you practice? What, what's your practice routine? Yeah. Um, well, again, <laughs> if you were asking me this last, last year, <laughs> it would be a very it would be a very different answer. Um, I have to say. Um, and yeah, you know, the thing about baroque trumpet is that it requires so much uh, physical. Uh, ability Mm -hmm. it's it's like it's so much more athletic than than even the modern trumpet which is already quite athletic Mm -hmm. 
but like in a typical typical year concert season like right now i would normally be preparing for all of these concerts at stanton all these different keys and different pitches and temperaments and instruments and repertoire and i mean usually those days i'm 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 putting in a good number of hours mostly just so I can physically get through things without um, compromising the artistic ideas that I, that I want to create. So yeah, it's usually a pretty serious amount of practice. Mm -hmm. Most of that is determined by what I have to do that week or what's coming up. But you know, even Messiah, like something I've played hundreds of times, Mm -hmm. um, I always, I always have to, you know, get myself back into that mode so that I'm physically ready more so than mentally, Mm -hmm. um, just because it's so much tougher. And so I'm finding during, during these Corona times that, um, that when I do play, I have been playing a bit of modern cornet. Mm. I have a, of course, being a nerd, I have a, like a 1920s um, cornet. Mm-hmm. So I place, I at least attempt to play some Bix Beiderbecke on that. Um, and I find that that takes way less strength, mm-hmm. way less strength than, than the Baroque trumpet. Mm-hmm. Because the Baroque trumpet is just so high and, and the endurance factor is just like so much more than a, period, than a modern instrument. Yeah, and you mentioned cornet and you said modern cornet because there's also... Uh, cornetto right indeed there is cornetto and and i do some of that too i used to do more uh when i lived on the east coast and i used to um i used to co-direct a group for cornets and sackbutts but um i find most of my my performing these days is is on baroque trumpet but every now and again i'll do a monteverdi vespers or or something like that. And so a cornetto, for folks who don't know what that is, you can always look it up on the old Google machine, but um, it's, oh. uh, it's a wooden instrument that is covered in leather and it has finger holes, but you blow into it and you make a sound um, like into a cupped mouthpiece. Uh, so that's why it's, it's technically a lip buzzed aerophone and that's what makes it a brass instrument, even though it's not made of brass. Mm. Um, sometimes people wonder, well, why is it the brass if it's not made of brass? Well, that's why. Mm. Um, but yeah, that instrument, you know, it has, it, it allows access to repertoire that most trumpet players don't get to experience. Like, um, you know, those polychoral pieces by Gabrielli and, um, you know, any, any of that, like Schutz um, music from the 16th and 17th century that is just so incredibly glorious. And if you don't know it, look it up because it's such amazing music. Um, but yeah, I think that's my favorite part about the cornetto is the repertoire. When this is all done and you're able to perform again, what's a piece, what's a composer, what is an organization maybe that you're just like, I can't wait to perform with that person or perform that mm-hmm. piece or that composer. Is there something that is just on your mind you just have to do when all of this is done? Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question because of course, with all this extra time and doing research on, on, you know, courses that I'm giving, uh, there's some bohemian repertoire from the 17th century that I'm just dying to do. There are these amazing Telemann uh, concerti for like two trumpets and two oboes and strings. And they just like knock your socks off. And I've done a couple of those things, but in my, in my time that I have to do more research, I'm finding other pieces because Telemann, man, you know, that guy, he just wrote so much music. Yeah. It's like, it's amazing when you think of how much music he wrote mm-hmm. and how much good music. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I feel like that's, you know, like you were saying earlier, like how do we get, how do we market this stuff? And I guarantee that if people were to come to a concert of, well, for example, like 17th century German sacred music with brass and strings, they, it would blow their minds. They would absolutely love it. But getting people to buy tickets for Heinrich Schutz motets, you know, they don't know what that is. I mean, of course, like, what are you going to do? Or even even someone like Telemann, who I think to most musicians is like, okay, well, you've at least heard of Telemann. Mm -hmm. But I think for the typical audience member, they would be like, hmm, I don't, you know, I don't really know what that is. So 
I don't know. I don't know if I'll go to that, yeah. but I guarantee they would love it. You know, yeah. it's not just about early music though. I think, you know, obviously you, you know, great music and there's all kinds of great music that isn't Beethoven five, not to say that Beethoven five isn't amazing, yeah. but there's all kinds of great music. And I guess, you know, I think the answer, you know, getting back to the question you asked, like how to, how, how to, let people know how great this stuff is. I think it comes from like audience members trusting organizations, do you know? Like yeah. like Portland Portland Baroque, no matter what they're going to have, it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't know the composers, if you don't know the music, you know, I think people start to just have to trust music directors or whatever to curate their experience so that you can trust like oh well if it's portland broke it's going to be great or if it's something tigran's involved in it's going to be amazing <laughs> thank you well, <laughs> you know well, an another thing with with great performers as well in these big organizations with so many amazingly talented uh, musicians is that is that sometimes um, even if the piece you the first time you heard it it was just okay maybe the second time you hear it with these amazing performers that bring so much energy and passion and just excitement yeah. to it you you'll enjoy it more because I've, I've noticed with certain pieces i've been to a performance i'm like well that was okay and i go to another performance a uh, couple mm -hmm. of reasons one is it's my second time so i'm like okay i'll listen to this and this and this and also another reason is that the performers are different so you get a different uh excitement yeah. about the piece so um and, and that's another thing i just wish some of these new pieces or pieces that have not been performed for hundreds of years mm -hmm. are, are given a couple of chances because just one chance is just not fair it's just not fair uh, that is a good point no you're so smart i i think i think you're totally right you know you know that's partly why sonata form is so fetching right because you it's built in yeah. that you're giving it an, an extra chance and yeah. then another one and then another one yeah. and that there's that sense of familiarity that um, you know, it's just like if you're going to a, a rock concert, I sound like an old person to say, but you know, like when you, you know, if you go to, you know, see a uh, popular music like Decemberists, that's another group that I love, um, you know, pop music, folk pop, um, you know, when you know the songs already, it's a, it's a very different experience than if you're going and hearing it for the first time, just like you said. And, and there's that sense of fami familiarity or the, the sense of, remembering this music and and seeing it again as they recreate it for you on stage it it becomes a, a completely different experience and i think i think that's exactly like what what you're getting at and how do we how do we cultivate that in our audience members who who don't already know how great that experience is going to be yeah. that's that's the question isn't it well, uh, last question again. Yeah. World class artists, I, I I like to know, and, and young musicians who are listening would love to hear. And if they they've been listening, they 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 learn so much about everything that you've said and uh, and your experiences and how to contribute to the communities and the, the the world in general, I guess. But what advice would you give to young musicians starting a career, struggling and trying to put it together? Yeah, you know the thing. The thing that I'm always reminded with my students as well as I as I um, hope to mentor them, you know, so much of it is about finding your own voice. And I know that sounds probably a little bit cheesy or trite, but but I think that's really what it's about. And and I think especially in this world right now, um, with people, you know, sharing their practice videos online and. You know, the focus tends to go to the outward, you know, like what will people think about this instead of what do I think and what do I have to say? Who am I as a person and how can I, how can I reflect who I am and, and what matters to me in my playing? Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like for the young ones, um, until, until you get to that point where you feel confident enough and age helps, it definitely does. But um, until you feel like super confident in your own vision and your own way, um, it's, it's really hard to, to, to not listen to the noise around you of what other people think about what you're doing or, 
any of that. And yeah, you know, you want, you know, your teachers are important and you have people who have an important influence on you and you want to listen to what they have to say. But even the most important teacher can never be as important as your own sense of what you want to say and the message that, that you want to deliver. That's, that's personally from you, but boy, that's the hard work, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Playing scales. Anybody can do that. You know, anyone can play scales. Anyone can memorize all these excerpts and, but like, but really sitting in the quiet and, and thinking about what does this excerpt mean? You know, what, what does this, you know, catacombs solo uh, the you know the trumpet solo from pictures uh, not picture and exhibition um, pines of Rome, the catacombs. You know what what does this mean? Is this is this just you know do I have to just make sure that I'm in tune and on time, or am I imagining what a catacomb is? And you know I'm I'm walking through the catacombs and I'm I'm looking. I'm looking at those graves and, I, and I'm seeing those skulls and I'm imagining someday that might be me and I am connected with humanity this way. I mean, that's what that solo is. It's not about, can you count to six on a long note, you know? That's amazing, Chris. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anything else you want to add before we end? Um, no, I mean, I think um, I I want to add, I guess, that it's so cool that you're doing this. And I've listened to a few episodes and and I always learn something new. And <laughs> I, I love to actually listen to podcasts while I'm painting. Oh, okay. And so some of some of your words are are getting mixed into some of my art. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'll have a show one day when everything is uh, back to yes. Week. Uh, and uh, and um, I, I'll come. I'll definitely stop by. Oh, that would be awesome! I would love that. Thanks so thanks. much for having me. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's been it's truly been an honor, and I want to thank you. And I rarely have guests who have really inspired me and influenced me. And and it was like I said, one of the uh, amazing things, and I'll repeat myself, but one of the amazing things <laughs> that uh, about you is that you're a world class artist, one of the leading artists uh, mm -hmm. in, in what you're doing. But you're also uh, an amazing individual, and and you're able to <laughs> connect with people who might at the time I didn't know much about it, and I would probably ask really weird questions, but you. You were so generous and thoughtful and in, 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 uh, talking to me. It meant a lot to me. And I, I, I still remember it even after a decade. So thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Have a beautiful day and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.